Welcome to the Animatio Shows. Today we're discussing, is Christianity a religious racketeer and business for African pastors? And are the NGOs simply profiting from African pain and bad governance? And is ISIS a state, a religious group, or a terrorist group? And finally, we have a special guest today whose insight will be valuable for our discussion. And how does this topic affect us as Africans? And what are our views? See you after the break. Oasis Banqueting Hall Barking is East London's first choice for any occasion, offering a range of services and facilities to suit your needs, whether it's a wedding, birthday, anniversary or religious service. 180 to 1000 guests, you can trust us to make your event truly special. Oasis Banqueting Hall Barking the perfect choice for your occasion. For bookings, call 0208-594-2222. Good day, I'm Danny Matthews, and to start with, I want to ask, is Christianity a religious racketeer in business for African pastors? And according to Pastor Sunday Adelaide in an article published in the International Business Times, it claims that most African pastors are the root cause of corruption and immoral value being promoted right across the pulpit of as faith. He went far as saying that the so-called African pastors are no better off than the politicians. These immoral values being promoted as religious belief and practice right from the pulpit of many churches are the root cause of the corruption in most African society. Why many pastors are living the extravagant lifestyles, flying over the world in their private jet and buying multi-million pounds houses across Europe and America, most of their congregations are in dire need and in serious poverty. Their memorandum of operation is the gospel of prosperity. The more you give to them to live their extravagant lifestyle, the blessed you might be. Many of us had had pastors claiming that giving huge tithes and offering that you probably cannot afford is the secret of prosperity. Really? That's a lie, and you're going to die in poverty. Why these pastors and their family are traveling the world in their private jet you help paid for, and the luxury cars and houses you've given your hard-earned blood and sweat money for them to enjoy. This false doctrine has been perfected by many pastors and actors pretending to be men of God, now in the UK and the stratosphere of African-dominated congregation. Roehampton University study counted over a thousand African churches in the southeast area of London alone, which is remarkable on its own, but the Danny Matthews research team estimated that there are over 5,000 churches in London and the surrounding area, and not only that, there are over 25,000 churches in UK and in Ireland. We know that Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, the NIV version states that, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in the house. The purpose of this is to make sure your tithe and offering are given equitably to the church, to members of the church, according to their need. But today we know that is not the case, because most of these pastors are using your tithe to live an extravagant life. Do we really need that? Well, after the short break, we'll be speaking to our special guest, Pastor Sam who is going to enlighten us about these issues and furthermore with issues regarding the NGOs. See you after the break. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the show. I'd like to welcome our special guest to the show today. He's an author and publisher of many life-changing books and above all, is a real man of God, Pastor Sam Adeomi. Pastor, is it okay I call you Pastor Sam? Yes, you can. Good, good, good. Welcome to the show. Yes, Before thank I start, you for before I start, I would like to just clear something. Is there anything that I've said in my introduction that you disagree with? Well, there are many things that you've said, but I'd like to just pick up on what the word racketeering. To, racketeering means you are in a racket, you are using uh, legitimate organizations to do illegitimate things. So it might be a little bit more uh, acceptable to say that people are taking advantage of the uh, congregation or the community of believers that are under them. So that, that's what I'd like to see. Well, taking advantage, racketeering, we have loads of churches who are like multiple churches right now. It's, it's a game. Well, I haven't said that. I wouldn't disagree with you. Maybe racketeering or taking advantage, at the end of the day, 
some people are, are paying the price. What I would like to, t to say, or you tell me, what are your views about this gospel of milking the congregation without doing any charitable work? We know a lot of churches, they just collect, 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 no charitable work, which is the foundation of the church. There are a lot of churches that are set up solely to make money. It's a business for them. And you, you, although they've come under the umbrella of a church and uh, a religious organization, they are not really churches. Biblically, we found that there are people who have an agenda who can't make ends meet, and they think the only way to, to get on in life is to set up what looks like a church and call it a church, but their intention is actually to make money. And that's totally wrong, you see? So what we, are right. looking, what we are looking at is, are they really churches or are they calling themselves churches? Now, this is a question that came from one of our producers. It's very important. So what do you think? These so-called big pastors organizing events solely to make money over here in UK, like the one-week festival of whatever it's called, they end up embezzling the money or siphon the money into their own private account. I mean, why they live a life of luxury? Many of their members, like I said in my opening statement, are suffering, both in UK, specifically even in Africa. What is your opinion about that? Well, that, without a question, those are wrong. You are not supposed to be using God's resources or what you have said to the people that you are collecting because you want to use it for God's resources, as God's resources, as God's tool to make your own ends meet. No, that is totally wrong. And God's wrath is on such people. Pastor, uh, when you say God's wrath, these yes. people are living a luxury life. Many of them have a private jet. Yes. They have luxurious homes. In yes. fact, some of the so-called leaders have homes in the most expensive areas in UK today. Yes. We're not going to mention them, but yeah, some in Welling Garden, some in the city of central London, some in the purchase area. They're not facing any wrath. They're milking it. Well, what we are looking at here will be what is on the temporal. This is where we are looking at. When after here, the judgment of God is going to be more severe for them. The Bible says that those who teach are under double judgment. So they may be pretending right now, but they know at the back of their mind, maybe they will think they will have the last opportunity to Are you calling them repent. actors as well? Because oh, yes, they are. They are because they know within themselves that what they are doing is wrong. The only spirit But they're good actors. Them. They should be nominated for award because yes, they're yes, making yes, millions. Yes, they are. And, and I don't know how, to, how they do it, but it's, when, you, when you are uh, godly, you, you find it hard to do some things and do some practices because you know, God is not, God is not going to look down on you with, he's, uh, he's going to look down on you with judgment. So but most of, this, most of these leaders are now franchising their, their churches like a business, like yes. McDonald's. You know, they are franchised. Not like they contribute back to this local church. They just have franchise and they have branding and they control the branding image. Yes. What's your opinion about that? Well, there, there's an organization that came from Africa, organized a program here in the UK. And I happened to help them. Uh, at that meeting, we were able to make about 8,000 pounds. And all of a sudden, the man said, oh, I'm taking the whole of 8,000 pounds to Africa. I said, OK, so what about those people that are here that need help? And some of them don't really consider that we have issues here or there are, there are needs here that needs to be met because they are looking at what they, what they, what they want to establish in their country or in their uh, but are they actually even helping anybody back home? Because I don't see them doing any charity. For instance, most of the expensive schools in Africa are owned by these so-called pastors. And even many of their members cannot afford to send their kids to the school. Yes, I, I've heard several things about that. I haven't made my own research. But I think... Oh, I can tell you the research. Yeah, I, what, I one of the really best, couple of the best schools are owned by pastors of certain churches. Most of those schools are, are the most expensive. 90% of their members can afford it. It's an it's a, it's a open fact. I just want to get to a point that's very, very important. God, this really bothers me. One of the things I've realized in many churches in the UK right now, most especially African churches, because they cannot face the scrutinization of the registering here as a charitable organization, right now, they're not, they're not even registered in this kind of charitable organization. Some of them are even registered as far as Ghana as a private entity and a private business so that they will not be scrutinized under the charitable law. Do you think that is fair? Well, you might not know how these things work, but I believe that uh, some of the registration is too strict, that some of them have to register as an organization first. In this country, you either register as a charity organization or a charitable organization. To register as a charity organization is very, very hard. But to register as a charitable organization, which is a company, is easier. So some of them come in as a charitable organization, and then later on, they are able to register as a charity. So that's the route that most churches are going to, through. Otherwise, they will remain there for a long time without being able to register. But that's not 
totally accurate because I, without mentioning him, obviously there are some churches that we are aware of that used to be registered as a charitable organization in this country and they run into huge financial difficulties from the charitable organization and um, they end up no more registering this country as a charitable organization, as rather as a private businesses offshore. What's your opinion about yeah. offshore registration? Because they don't want to face the scrutiny of charitable law. I, I don't think that's completely true because you're using one of them to mean everybody. That one might have a problem that they have to address and because they are still under scrutiny or they are being prevented to do certain things, they cannot operate in this country legally. Why? So because why they, they, can't, they, they cannot operate else. because they're not following the law. As a charitable organization, they need to show their laws. They need to show their financial details and needs to be clear. Yeah. I, I agree that some of the churches, really, they are, what they are doing is wrong. But because I am part of a charity and I understand how they work, re uh, the recent uh, introduction now is that Ofsted is going to be monitoring churches. Which I think is a brilliant idea. Well, for you, yes, but we are not going to be able to do certain things if, we, if Ofsted starts like to what? Come, come in. They have to now say, okay, unless it's secularized, some of our teachings will not be acceptable. Hmm. Dawkins will come in and say, okay, we can't do certain things. And I think that is why a lot of judges are finding it difficult to come and register as a charity because they know that they are not going to be able to operate as a church. Hmm, interesting. Well, Pastor, I hope you're going to stick around because yes. I still have something else I want to discuss with you. We're going to be talking about NGOs in Africa because there's loads of them. It's just milking the pain and bad governance of the African government. I'll be around. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're still watching The Annie Matthew Show. Our next topic is, are NGOs simply profiting from African pain and bad governance? Apparently, there are thousands of NGOs set up in the West for the benefit of African countries. Anything you can think of, there's a non-for-profit organization set up to raise money for this cause. There are billions of pounds and dollars being raised every year for African benefit, yet none of it is accountable or none of it that can be seen being adequately spent. Case in question, Bob Gedoff and the like of Red Nose daily raise millions of pounds for African countries or for African aid. The question is, how have they spent this money? Where is this money? How much of this money are actually given for the benefit of the cost being raised? To my own estimation, I believe less than 3% of this money that has been given to African countries for the benefit of the aid being raised. Where is the rest? Where is the rest money going to? Furthermore, NGOs need to be seriously scrutinized. Don't get me wrong, NGOs have their purpose. My simple advice would be, before you give any money to any charitable organization, you need to first of all find out how much is the money they're actually raising are going to the courses they're raising the fund for. Ask the Red Cross how much is being paid to their directors and how much actually going to the good cause. We still have Pastor Sam with us, and we're going to actually now seek his opinion about NGOs, which is very important. Pastor Sam, yes. what are your views about the NGOs claiming to be helping Africans, and still we really don't know how they've been scrutinized? Well, I, I think it's the intention of the developed countries to keep the developing countries forever subsidized to them. I think is not written down, but they are doing it systematically so that we can continue to rely on them. When they raise funds to go to uh, a course in Africa, 70% of that fund goes to logistics and administration. So the 30% is what actually gets to the ground where now they now distribute, uh, if they are able to get anything going with the 30% towards the course that they have set up uh, as the reason why they are send, uh, raising the funds. So I'm not surprised that not a lot is happening. I, I the think there's the actual amount that goes to the cause they raise is far less than that. Because an average director for most of these charitable organizations, they they, they're in the millions. And the logistic is what? The overhead cost is what? They, they, I think it's the salary pay. Another thing I want to ask you, do you think their very presence, this so-called, just go online, Google. You see, so many, anything you could think of, there's an NGO set up called Clean Water for this, for that, for that. Do you think their very presence in Africa is not allowing most African leaders to confront issues because of this NGO's interference? Well, like I said earlier on, 
I think this, this setup is supposed to make us more reliant on them. So really, without them, we cannot do many things. And if um, we want to be on our own, we will struggle a lot because we won't be able to do things by ourselves. When, this, when these NGOs go to uh, Africa, what they do is they make sure that they are giving you the fish. They don't teach you how to, how to fish. That's true. And, and that way you won't be self-reliant. So it means that you have to keep asking them for more and for more and for more. That's why the problem is still there. Well, Pastor, now let's talk about your book. Like I said, the pastor is not just a man of God. He's also a, an author, a publisher of so many wonderful books, books that will transform your life. And if you want to find out more about him, we're going to put more details on our website about his books, about where you can get them. The first thing, Pastor, let's talk about this one first. Yes. Uh, good finish to Bastard. It's not a very popular title for uh, many, many uh, writers. It's just kind of talk, good finish to Bad start. Exactly. I've been asked, how do you go from good finish to bad start? No, that's not the way it is. It's good finish to a bad start. I had a bad start. This is a good finish to a bad start. But in, in writing, you have to make sure that you phrase it in, in a more advanced way. Uh, good finish to my bad start. We want, I want to say in the book that if whatever way you start from, uh, whether it's rough or bad, you can finish well. If you follow God, if you follow the patterns in the Bible, God can make you finish well. So there's no... Uh, there's no final end to anyone that is still alive that, okay, this is how you're going to die now. Because oh, God can bring you out of whatever problem you That's very good. Good finish to Bastard. How about this one? Your, your basket kneeling bow. That's, that's a strange word. What, what did you say today? Well, it looks like a long title because I'm not into long titles. But the, the key word there is the kneeling bow. Your basket is what your salary brings in. You collect, of course, you use your basket to collect things. So that's what your salary brings in. But your kneading bowl is what you do with your hands. A lot of people are teaching wrongly about biblical prosperity. They don't encourage people to go out there and do what they can do naturally to bring in the resources. So that's what I'm focusing on, that the way to get yourself out of depending on the system and depending on the church is to be able to do things with your hands. That's what the kneading bowl is about. Oh, well, I actually like this. Triumph, turning temptation into trap. That's a very difficult. We all face temptation and everything. What's, it, what's, what's this about? Turning temptation to triumph is about those who uh, fall into various types of temptation. And we are saying that you can't stay there. You can still come out successful. You can still come out triumphant. But a lot of people think that's the end of me. I've messed it up. I can't do anything anymore. And also I'm telling people who haven't gone into it that you need to look out for those signs so that you can avoid going into them in the first instance. So that's what the book is about. Brilliant. How about this one? I actually like this. Healed in Jesus' name. That sounds like a sermon. Yes. In 2014, September, I had an incident, a fire incident, and all my face was burnt. Really? You don't really look it. You still look well, handsome people, and young, Many sir. people tell me, but I, w I wish that you go through it so, so that you can be mad. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I choose not to. I think yeah. I'll, 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 I'll listen to your experience. Yes. What, what, what happened in this one is, through my, my experience, in 11 days, all was clear. And I was able to say to people, God still heals people. Uh, many years ago, I collected materials to be able to publish a book on healing, but it didn't materialize until I had the experience. Now I had the experience to validate or whatever I had before. And I'm saying to people, if you follow God, you follow his word, God can heal you. And I've shared in that book many, many um, uh, forms of diseases and what scriptures you need to use to be able to counter it, and God can heal you. Oh, brilliant. This is very good. I've got about three or four. Is there any one of them you're going to sign for me today? So I can, I'm going to put more information about this book on our website. And as well, you're going to see more information on the show and after the show. So one thing is, don't go away. We'll be right back. Our last topic for the day and my final conclusion will be about ISIS. Are they a state? Terrorist group? Freedom fighter? Or what are they? You decide, we talk. See you after the break. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the show. My final thought. Is ISIS a state, a religious group, a freedom fighter, or a terrorist group? These are the questions people like myself have been asking, who are neither a Muslim or a politician with vested interest in the Middle East. Without being labeled as an ISIS sympathizer, I would like to state categorically that, with every fiber of my being, I reject what the ISIS stands for because they have done unimaginable things. But at the same time, one cannot fail to acknowledge that the rise of ISIS is due to the Malaki government and failure to integrate the Iraqi society adequately. This issue is far more complex than what the politicians are letting us know in the West. 
because according to the Council of Foreign Relations, the current conflict is an old age war that is foiling this current divide between the Sunni-led Arab and the Shia-led Arab. Apparently, the growing sectarian clashes are sparked into the revival of the transformational jihadist network that pulls a threat to the global world. The Sunni-led Wahhabism doctrine on the right hand side by the Saudi Arabia and as well the Shia led transformational doctrine by Iranian side on the other side are the power base that is foiling this conflict. One cannot amaze that apparently it is difficult to see a way through this without actually addressing those power struggle to understand why Syria is in this mess. The Western government have a standard that say they do not negotiate with terrorism. Now, why are we negotiating with the freedom fighters? Assad have claimed these so-called freedom fighters are terrorists. And any government that say a freedom fighter or an organization is a terrorist, we must stand by them. We cannot choose or impose a government on them. We can only advise. Apparently not. By encouraging this internal conflict in Syria has led to the war and the total destruction of Syria and has led to the growth of ISIS. ISIS is not a figment of imagination. It was the creation of the freedom fighter. America and the West have spent millions of pounds promulgating, guiding this so-called free Syrian army. How many have they turned out to be? Less than 10 so-called credible army. The rest are ISIS, destroying Syria. Before the invasion of this terrorist group, labeled by Assad, by the way, I must categorically also state, I'm not a fan of Assad. Assad is a bad guy. We all know that. He killed his own people. He bombed his own people. But I can assure you, the ISIS will do worse. Before ISIS very assistant in Syria, what do we have? We have majority of the Christians flourishing in Syria. We have Jews flourishing. We have non-Muslim flourishing. But today, many of them are fleeing the country. Most of the people fighting for the Assad government today are Christians. Check your fact. Many of them are non-Shia or non-Muslim. Another fundamental thing, the thing you must be aware of in Syria before the invasion, majority of Syrians are Sufi Muslim. Sufi Islam, they are the ones that believe in the mystical personal relationship with God. They are like the Christian of Muslims, whereby they believe in the personal relationship rather than a doctrinal relationship of a Wahhabism or doctrinal relationship of a Shiaism. But you can be a, a Sunni Muslim and still be a Sufi Muslim. You can be a Shia Muslim and still be a Sufi Muslim. And Sufism is that entity of internal personal growth. I, like I said, this war is a war of choice. This is a war of choice that the power base of Sunni and Shia are now in conflict. And now as a Western government, who do we support? If we bomb ISIS, ISIS and many Sunni we call us enemy. If we bomb Shia-led group, many of Sunnis we call us enemy. There are no choices here, but alternatively than to support the current regime. As bad as Assad is, Assad is still the sitting government, and there is no legal right by any definition for any country to invade the airspace or the territory of a sitting government. It's only by the international law, but or by the law given the right by UN before you can invade the space and start bombing. Has anyone asked the current government the right to invade their airspace and drop any bomb? Apart from Russia. Russia right now is playing on international law. I do not agree on many things Putin is doing, but I must say Putin is on the right side of this war. It's good that Britain and the rest of the Western country are getting into this war, but they must first of all ask themselves, which side are you on? Which side? I personally think this government should support the Assad government. Assad must go, yes, but right now it's a better choice. If not, look at what happened in Libya. Look at what happened in Egypt. Do you want the same government? close at the border end of Israel. These are the enemy of the government. These are the enemy of the West. We must fight a good fight. Not a fight of choice, not a fight of, of, of partisan, not a fight that demands being on the part of terrorists. As far as one government says this group are terrorists, they hope to be liberal terrorists. Freedom fighter or not, ISIS is a terrorist group, same as the free Syrian army to be labeled as a terrorist group. 
as long as they've destabilizing the country. Finally, we come to the end of the show. Hope you've enjoyed the show and hope to see you next week. To we meet again and to Queen and Country. I'm Danny Matthews. Good night and God bless.